Hello, hello again with uh, the International Euphonium Festival. I'm your host, Nicholas Hopper von Heidi, and I have a really amazing guest. And welcome, Andrea Hobson from now Germany. Yeah, formerly South Africa, but it's right. my country. Yeah. The <laughs> homeland is uh, South Africa, and uh, and she has an, a really amazing story to show, a uh, showcase of just an amazing journey and uh, I'm honored to have her on as well as uh, for you watching um, or listening to these uh, podcasts. Uh, I hope you find the value that she brings um, and offer it to those that you think would be of uh, who would benefit as well. So share, share away uh, and uh, leave a comment below letting us know where you're watching this from, uh, especially if you're uh, from South Africa yourself or, you know, where around the world are you from? So uh, further ado, Andrea Hobson is a brass performer, music educator, and composer. She was a finalist in the Lubner Music Competition and was awarded the Lubner Maid, M-A-I-D, Music Scholarship to study music. She studied at Rhodes University and the University of the Free State under Professor David Scar and Dr. Paul Lov van Zulenberg. I hope I said that right. Salenberg, close though, very, very close. <laughs> cool. She graduated in 2010 with a master's in music, majoring in euphonium performance, brass pedagogy, and composition. Yeah, three, pretty cool. Uh, not typical in the United States, for sure. Um, Andrea has performed with the Kwazulu Natal Philharmonic Orchestra. Did I say that? Right. Okay. Yeah. A Cape Philharmonic Orchestra, Wind Works, and Cape Town Concert Brass. She is a South African National Youth Orchestra Foundation alumna, having performed as both the principal euphonium player in the Wind Orchestra and principal trombone player in the South African National Youth Orchestra. She was also one of the original members as well as tutor of the South African National Youth Brass Ensemble lead by Mar led by Mark Hampson of the UK. Andrea has conducted and tutored for the East London Wind Orchestra course. Internationally, Andrea has held positions with the Bern Youth Orchestra in Switzerland on principal trombone and has conducted in the Zimbabwean National Music Camp Wind Band in 2013 and 17. She attended the International Euphonium Tubi Festival in Atlanta, Georgia in June of 2014, where she received classes with Thomas Rudy, Adam Frey, Fry, ah, and a master class with David Thornton of the UK. Andrea was accepted to attend the International Music Festival in Pelotas, Brazil in 2015, January, and received tutelage from Fernando de Dos of Brazil. She was awarded the Earl L. Lauder, Lauder Award to attend the 2018 International Euphonium Tuba Festival in the US. She was one of the founding members of the Fax Trio which was dedicated to presenting new contemporary styles of music. She also has been involved in projects including Proboscis. 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 Yeah. Baobab Trio. Baobab, it's a kind of tree. Okay, Baobab. Uh, and the O9, a collaboration with the... Shot Ensemble, too. Okay. Okay. Not appropriate, but it's true. <laughs> cool. Uh, where she composed and arranged music for the various performances. And I have Andrea actually go through some of these pronunciations uh, right now as you're watching this where uh, to get the the overall international experience. Uh, you know, I wanted to uh, showcase kind of the time difference between uh, continents. And so right now it's 2 a.m. as opposed to where Andrea is, it is? 8.46 in the morning. Awesome. So it's an early, both early risers uh, in a way. Uh, apparently she's uh, maybe had some more coffee than I have. Uh, maybe. <laughs> um, 
So she's also uh, she has also composed music for euphonium soloists. We'll cover uh, just shortly here. Um, brass band, brass ensemble, and orchestra. These works have been performed in the U.S., U.K., Singapore, Germany, and South Africa. She initiated the formation of the Southern African Tuba and Euphonium Association, which has hosted three Southern African tuba and euphonium courses with top international and national tutors, including Adam Fry, Patricio Constantino, and Albert Qatar. Right? Qatar? Yeah. Okay. okay. She is based in Jena, Germany, uh, and freelances as a soloist, chamber music musician, and a band musician. She teaches lower brass uh, ensemble and theory at the Orchest uh, Orchestra School Klagwelt and conducts the brass band uh, Feel Klag uh, Klang Jugen uh, Jugen Brass Band Ble uh, Blech Klang. Blech. Thank you and the Junior Brass Band um, and more recently uh, she is a re uh, recently had her proposal grant uh, to uh, compose the 12 play-along compositions for brass instruments accepted by the Kulturstiftung des Freistaat Thuringes Deutschland. Awesome, in Germany. And I'm, I'm cheating here. She wrote the uh, city name. I've, I'm so out of practice with my uh, German uh, and my Deutsche that uh, I'm like, I, I, I want to... Um, step to the side in a little bit and I'll work on that as these uh, as these summits progress because uh, I don't like to be uh, it's I love linguistics but it's also uh, it's really interesting that she also uh, has one of her latest works African Sky Euphonium <laughs> Solo now part of the 2024 Leonard Falcone uh, competition uh pieces that are required music for the euphoniums so congratulations on that Thank it's you. really awesome we'll put the links below to everything with her bio to uh her awesome works and she also um she also has a really awesome uh performer who uh artist uh though it's flugelhorn and i wanted to showcase this also on our uh podcast here jennifer oliveria she wanted to really, Andrea really wanted to uh, give a shout out to her uh, for her work with her uh, her solo that she wrote for. She got commissioned by her, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Silver Backed Fox. Yeah. Awesome. So way to go, Jennifer Oliveria. Um, would be really cool to see if there would be a, I don't know, a flugelhorn a euphonium uh, duo, uh, duet with. That would be amazing. That would be so brass bandy. It sure would. Uh, like a uh, kind of, you know what? Uh, I like how foxes play back and forth. Uh, it'd be a really cool uh, uh, work uh, feature as a brass band. I don't know. May maybe I'm calling this into uh, action here. Yeah, I'm, I'm, writing, I'm writing it down as a piece. Right. Silver backed fox duet feature uh, for flugelhorn and euphonium uh, for brass band. <laughs> That'd be really cool. Uh, and uh, featured in Germany. Uh, oh, uh, and I forgot you just uh, you just uh, uh, were awarded the stick for as conductor of uh, which band? The Jürgen Brass Band Blechlang. So previously I was doing with the youth development and the adult development. And as of this year, I get to take over the Jürgen, which is like the in between the sort of, you know, teenage years. Awesome. That Congratulations. Uh, I, I, I will definitely have to kind of copy paste that as we uh, as I create the creatives and blog posts and all that good stuff. Um, yeah. Welcome to the stage. Welcome to the International Euphonium Festival. Thanks. <laughs> good to be awesome. here. Awesome. Uh, I'm so very honored to have you on as one of the first to have accepted uh, across the pond in a way. Uh, internationally speaking, you were one of the very first to accept uh, the offer to come on uh, for the International Euphonium Festival. Um, as I did cool. see, really, this growing past the United States, uh, I don't know, the nearsightedness. Um, 
the euphonium community is so open and willing to uh, accept everyone from all around the world and it, it's really I you know as such a small instrument and our parents that are watching this or our beginner euphonium artists that are watching that uh, get to see this uh, this new inception of uh, what uh, technology brings uh, uh, you even as uh, those that are watching now the ability to get perspectives from other countries and uh, boy howdy the transcripts before this by the way as I say with all the interviews it's really gold so you might want to uh, consider picking up those transcripts uh, there is some editing when it goes into the international waters or those with uh, uh, accents. Uh, my otter is not uh, fluent in all the linguistical patterns just yet. Um, and as time progresses, we shall see where those go. Um, so leave a comment where you're at, where you're watching from. Uh, let Andrea know uh, what uh, this interview means to you. Uh, and this is, oh, that's fine. Uh, yes, Nova's joined us. My cat's had enough. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. If you want to showcase her, this this cat is really interesting. I've never heard this breed of cat. It's a Norwegian forest cat. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm thinking like Norwegian forest cat. And it almost sounds like uh, uh, something from some mythological book. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, she looks a little bit like this one. I mean, they, they look a little bit like the Mancoons. They've just got prettier faces. Like, they've got sort of more um, petite faces. But yeah, she's also camera shy. She does not, she's not somebody who performs with the camera. Oh, that's funny. So, but, she does, but she does meow with me when she feels like I've had enough time on the, on the phone or computer. She, I, I have a question for uh, those that are, uh, before we get into the interview, uh, per se, in the minuets, as uh, we're going to create over the, uh, the time being. Is does she ever accompany you when you practice? Oh, she hates the euphonium. She really doesn't like it. I'm I'm convinced it's the vibration. I mean, we have we have um, a better relationship now when I practice at home. She's got a cat tree, and before she would leave, she would exit the room completely. She now sits at the very top of the cat tree and sort of glares at me for the entire practice session. So she's no no fan. But I think it is. I mean, I think it is the euphonium is quite a sonorous sound. So I think it's maybe the vibrations. You know, it must they've got sensitive ears. Have, have you tried using a mute in practicing and seeing how that works? No, I have not. I I'm could curious. Try. Maybe, yeah, maybe, I could try. maybe next time we'll get an update on seeing if that works <laughs> for uh, your kitty. Uh, Nova, uh, her name is Novis? Nova. Nova. That's like awesome. Supernova. She has um she has like a star explosion on the very front of her face. It's, she's she's like she's a tortoise shell, but in grays. She's got like different versions of grays, and then on her face there's like an explosive white. And so we named her after the supernova, but she's then just Nova. That's Although really her, cool. her character's pretty super, so you know. That's really awesome. She can be our our mascot in a way. Uh, for the... Yeah, she'll, she'll really love that. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Maybe really that'll, that'll, maybe that'll earn some favor points from her. <laughs> yeah, <definitely. laughs> so let, let, let's uh let's dive into your uh uh your your opening uh your opening uh minuet uh as uh we're we're evolving e every day um you know to give reference to where we're at in the interview process as the as the initial from just last month to now the interview before andrea's was micah dominic parsons from the uk um and then um oh boy uh dr nathan daughtry and then aaron uh uh vander wheel um from the u.s so if you go back and seeing the segments as this grows maybe this will give you a uh, a hope or a perspective of you know just starting where you're at wherever you are with a student artist or a parent or uh, someone who is uh, in the collegiate or has that entrepreneurial kick to your euphonium career or whatever instrument or however just start uh, mm -hmm. so with further ado thank you so much for joining us Andrea Hobson from Germany of South Africa 
um, exciting to have you on. Uh, it, it, it really, it, it truly is a pleasure to have you on, especially being one of the uh, newly announced Leonard Falcone uh, composers uh, part of this and female artist as well as female composer uh, and not to be uh, gender biased at all it's just showcasing how unique our field has uh, is euphonium artists uh, and diverse that uh, mm -hmm. you know we we have such a, a welcoming I I, th I think as euphoniums uh, the family I think it's a bit more welcoming than everyone else, especially who play in the orchestra field, uh, because we we don't really play in the orchestra. So, you know, that mindset. Um, yeah. What age did you first learn euphonium? Um, so I actually started with piano. Um, my mom believes that music is super important for education. So I was playing piano for a few years and then we moved because my dad's a, min a Methodist minister to Port Elizabeth, now called Kabelka, which I can't pronounce properly because of the click. So that was probably 10, 11 years old. I think I must have been, it turned, I must have turned 11. Yeah. And so that's when I started the euphonium. Wow. Awesome. Um, and not baritone, euphonium proper, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, so as I said, like I started piano because where that area of South Africa, there isn't actually uh, much brass. Port Elizabeth, which is then on the coast, obviously due to the former colonialists, had more wind band, brass band history. Uh, the school that I went to was also a single sex um, girls school, Christian girls school with a very British background. So I think originally it would have been brass band and then obviously over the time they, they made it a wind band program. So I wasn't just tested on the euphonium. I think I was approved for oboe and I didn't like the, the high frequency. So the brass teacher was, I guess I will take her. And then he tested me on everything. He was a Russian guy who then left at the end of the year anyways, but he um, tested me for all the brass instruments and actually recommended the tuba. But um, I was really small. I haven't really grown since then. I'm just, uh, quite small in stature. And then, so the euphonium was then the better option. But as I got better on the euphonium, I kind of fell in love with it. And that was kind of over then for any other instrument. So what was it like uh, growing up as a um, minister, if you don't mind me diving into yeah, being... Okay. Uh, in a U.S. as a minister's kids, we call them PKs. Uh, yeah, we also teach kids. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so as a PK and uh, um, preacher's kid, and uh, and the history of the colonialism. Let's dive into how you um, first started. Like, what was your going from piano to um, the historically significant uh, area that you're in, um, I, I want to capture that perspective. Can you uh, enlighten our audience uh, with Sorry, Alexa. Perhaps... You, you, you've said to Alexa, you said something to Alexa. <laughs> oh, Alexa went off. Alexa. Yeah, you've, you've awakened Alexa. I think she's on here. I can think she's finished. No? No, okay. Something happened. Anyway, so, um, so at the time I didn't really give. I mean, I was young and I didn't really um, give much thought to any of that. Um, as I've gotten older, I think it's just also because of South Africa having a, a apartheid history. It's just being very aware of. Um, I'm just more aware. It's just as being being a preacher's kid and also my mum being an educator. I've just become more aware of how to be careful about language representation um, and kind of, yeah, just keeping in mind that you can do better with your future, but that doesn't mean that you must ignore your past, you know, so there are offenses that you can, um, that you can kind of repeat and one must be careful not to do that. Right. Um, yeah. But I mean, at the time that I started it, I would not have been aware of it at all, aware of it at all. It's kind of come with time, you know, and sort of how the country also progressed and how the world's also progress. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. When, when you first started the band world and started your uh, time specifically on euphonium, what was it like playing in, uh, were you ever aware of like brass bands before kind of that? No? No, not really. No, no, no. I mean, it really was just, here's a brass instrument. And then I think um, at the time, I practiced like regularly for 15 minutes, and then it was here is a wind band and make noise. 
And so that's what we did. I think after two years, I then joined a local ensemble, which was then sort of a mixture of adults um, and students. And I think it was, I kind of got the, the, the um, task of just play an F whenever you see an F, because I was very new to the instrument. And so that's how I did it. And that was more in the direction of a brass band. Um, yeah, but at the time, I mean, I was completely unaware of what these things mean, a wind band or a brass band. I just wanted to play. So it was very much a very childlike perspective, you know. Well, that's cool. So did you get to take your instrument home? And yes? Yes, yes. Wow. and it was heavy. It was um, one of the really old Jupiter euphoniums. And it was in this very uncomfortable square case. I mean, the instrument, well, I mean, it was just a joke of my family that the instrument was the same size as myself. And that when I played, all you could see, because my dad used to do my hair for school, and all he could do was a, on top of the head ponytail. So all you could see was the instrument and the ponytail sticking out you know, from behind it. You couldn't really see me. Um, yeah, and it was really heavy because between the music department and the parking place where the, where the cars would park, there were two netball fields. So often I'd have to then carry my instrument with two hands and my dad would then carry my, my school bag because it was quite heavy. Yeah. When, when did uh what would what did they say when you first brought the euphonium home my parents uh -huh. uh, i remember my grandfather my grandfather was like why are you playing a foghorn that was and that became like a joke because he was quite far, far up north in south africa so the only thing he heard was a telephonic conversation of was like boop so that was his question like how so it was first why are you playing the foghorn and then later is how is the foghorn going my parents were completely overwhelmed. They, my mom, not, neither one of them is particularly musical. I think my dad plays like, you know, chunky chunk guitar in, in, in the church, you know, so just chordal stuff and also not super. Um, my mom can't really sing so well. She's got great rhythm, but her, yeah, her vocal training that was not great. So coming home with this euphonium, I think they were just sort of like, what is this and why? But at the same time, as I mentioned, my mom is very pro music as an educational tool. She thinks that music is super for developing brain stuff. Um, so they were very excited that I was then going to be involved in a band program. Yeah. That's awesome. Let's dive back into the piano. When did you pick piano up? Oh, gosh, I think it was like four or five. So in South Africa, you can start either a recorder and then where I was, uh, marimba. So I what? skipped the recorder. Yeah, I was like- off Marimba? Yeah, like off-size marimbas. Um, I don't know if you guys know off, it's like an educational, but like African off marimba. So it's called Wuch. And I was like in a marimba class, you know, for rhythm. And then um, it must have been, no, then it must have been five, six that I started uh, uh, piano. So quite early on. Um, and yeah, as I said, it was for finger coordination, reading coordination, all that kind of stuff. You know, my mom was quite forward thinking for South Africa then, you know, um, in terms of it, how music is for education. So hindsight and retrospect with choosing the marimba uh, first, what, are you happy to have gone that route or would you have you'd chosen the other? Um, having had to teach recorder classes later as a way for kids to then follow onto brass instruments, I am very grateful having skipped the recorder. <laughs> but at the time, I would, yeah, I mean, at the time, I wouldn't have known much of a difference. It was fun. I mean, I think also from from sort of vibration and feel, it's a much a lower kind of register. And that's always sat with me quite well, which is probably why I still play euphonium. Um, yeah, so in hindsight, and having, having as I said, having to teach record, I'm quite grateful that I kind of skipped over the recorder time. The Sorry, it's not my, I think the recorder played as a master is absolutely beautiful, but I feel so sorry for recorder having to be used as this educational tool where people play B-A-G, B-A-G, you know, it's it's really does the instrument no justice, which is kind of unfair. True, true. Yeah. Um, kind of like how uh, so playing only f's as you started reading music and getting to learn that the yeah. whole, i well let's put it into perspective here uh was it bass clef or treble clef yeah so so this is the thing so or tenor I, could clef. Actually, I could it was bass clef no it was bass clef so i could read due to my piano i think it was more a coordination thing because what um, at the time, as, as much as we had a wind band, there wasn't really, like what we have now at the school that I work at here in Germany, there wasn't really a structure for beginners 
and then moving through that bond. So your options were start the instrument, play it three months, then you get whacked into a fairly advanced band. So the whole playing F was just for the adult band. We were playing Sousa, Semper Fidelis, and I couldn't do that as a beginner. So my teacher was just like, play F. And Semper Fidelis was then actually, I didn't, uh, I, I just learned the fingering, the I, I still can remember the fingering. That was the, the first thing that I learned. Um, so the F was just the guideline, you know, that I wouldn't get frustrated because it was, you know, we went, I think the, the other first piece that we did was a Frank Sinatra medley with, you know, all this kind of key changes. So I just wasn't that advanced yet, which was why uh, Mr. Stradorm was like, just play F. Whenever you see F, just play F. And then later it was like, now play F and G. And then now play F, G and B. So he was really great in terms of being, and actually the whole community was super supportive in, in developing. So I wasn't the only one. Um, Nalisa played trombone, Bongo played tuba. We had like a whole range of young women playing brass instruments because it was an all girls school. So we had quite a good support system. So you said community. How did, um, are you talking about the greater community or the community within just the school? I'm talking about the greater community. So Mr. Stradom, who, so I said I started with a Russian guy. He left um, at, towards the end of the year and Mr. Stradom started. Mr. Stradom, um, I think it's originally from the UK and he had moved to South Africa and been in South Africa for a very long time and married a South African woman. He was then the brass teacher at our school, but then ran this adult uh, community band on the Monday evenings. And so all the students that he taught at school, if they showed any promise, he would get them into the conservatory band, which was what it was called at the time. And so, yeah, we had support from the school in general. The school also had really great music programs. So I was very lucky where I'm from. We've got a really great wind band uh, uh, program with all the schools in the area. Um, and so we had this, the support there, but then also having to play with the kind of being able to play with the conservatoire band and develop that way. That was then a combination of professional musicians and amateur musicians. So, so yeah, greater community, I guess. Yeah. That, that's phenomenal because here, uh, the perspective difference from the U.S. I mean, globally, it's um, it's quite um, in, in a way it's it's really unique uh, to hear the differences uh, between. I mean, we like locally where I'm at in Central Texas, we have a community band as well, and it's really awesome. And you know, younger artists can be part of it, uh, especially you know, it's really big on euphonium. Uh, because, you know, the guy who, uh, Ken Wood, is an amazing artist in his own right. And he's the one that uh, has the uh, variations of the Yellow Rose of Texas. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, that's the yeah, guy who wrote that. Yeah. Um, so he's right down the road from me, like less than like five miles or so. Um, yeah. And so I'm, you know, and it's really interesting to, I mean, I guess the bigger cities here in the United States, so now Houston has a youth orchestra or a youth band, uh, well, youth orchestra, and it's just not kind of a typical thing we see nowadays. Um, it's not as prevalent as it is uh, like in Germany or or South Africa. Uh, yeah. um, what would be like, what was the coolest thing that happened uh, during your first year of playing euphonium? That's totally off script. So like I was warning you uh, before. No, I've got it. Um, uh, uh, so at the beginning, Uptown Girl, it's quite an old Uptown, Uptown Girl. girl. The, yeah. the euphonium started that. There was like a boom, boom, boom from the tuba and then the euphoniums all had it. I mean, so the, how the program also worked is that I think at the beginning we were like, seven euphonium players and then by the end of the year it kind of whittled down to three and there, there was there, those were then our we were in friends seven. Seven. yeah yeah so it's kind of like what we do here as well we take on as many students as possible because you know as children you know you want people to have the opportunity to try but it's not everybody's cup of tea right. so then by the end of it we kind of whittled down and this is how the program worked and all the euphonium players got to do bum 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 ba -di -da -di -da -di -da, and that da -di -da -di -da, and we had to play it in a solo and it was very scary. And I remember then all of us doing the solo together, all of us being absolutely petrified, but we all managed it. I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, there's no recording and maybe that's a good thing, but it was it was quite a big moment. Yeah. So probably that uptown girl. That's awesome. So I, I'm <laughs> assuming the first notes were F. 
No, I think it was actually B. I think it was B, C, B. I'd, I'd already gotten, so it was at the end of our academic year, so I'd gotten a bit better. I could at least play, you know, a ninth or a tenth, you know. <laughs> That's really awesome. So as the, as your community band and really your, so was that considered a conservatory or? The, yeah, so the, 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 the ensemble that we played on on Monday was like a private school. So this, this comes back to what happened in South Africa with the education. I'll just do a quick uh, rundown yes, about the please. history. Um, in former apartheid, music was considered a subject, but it was also um, for upper class and very wealthy people and specifically then um, Caucasian. And then what happened was is when the country changed into a new government, because music was then unfortunately used as a a tool for apartheid they wanted to get rid of music as a subject in the school uh, which makes sense you know i think everybody was on top of it i'm like pro that but obviously for music educators and music teachers they wanted to then not have music dwindle so a lot of private music schools started so in cape town which i later moved to they've got two music schools two large music schools one in the northern suburbs one in the southern suburbs due to this and then they found that actually, no, music, because it's cultural, is really, really good. It's also really great for healing purposes and bringing people together. So it was then put back into the school syllabus. Oh, wow. Um, and so it was a little bit troubling then for the private schools that had opened or these conservatories, but they continued going because I think, as music is, everybody has an interest in music. So then they kind of worked together. And, you know, it's really interesting how you, you're mentioning that. I think it, and that goes with studios, Euphonium Studios per se, is, you know, not every studio is someone's cup of tea or, you know, and so you have to really find that culture that you fit in, which yeah. is another great reason why we have this at the International Euphonium Summit is to showcase these the the personality of artists and composers like Andrea Hobson and everyone else before and after. Um, it's it's really a delight to get to be able to capture this on the technology that we have today um, and to be the first. I, I, I really, uh, it's really exciting to uh, really substantiate our little, little world uh, and not be baby tubas anymore. It's like, yeah. look, we're yeah. we're real, well, we're yeah, right. We're real horns. Uh, <laughs> so euphoniums, uh, euphonium artists. Uh, uh, even twenty years ago, when you know, I, I'm a, I'm kind of dating myself. Even twenty years ago, now you know, with the internet, where it definitely isn't where it was 20 years ago uh, at yeah. all. Uh, even I, mean, I don't think that you're dating yourself. When I when I was at school, and it's really funny because obviously now being, I mean, I'm 37 years old and I'm talking to kids and we had the dial up, you know, we had a computer and it took 40 minutes. Uh -huh. First of all, it took 40 minutes for the computer to switch on. And then that was so at the beginning, we didn't have any internet. And then we got internet. So it was 40 minutes to wait for the computer to come on. And then 40 minutes for the internet to connect with that, that horrible ringing back phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah AOL. Um, right? kids, you know, when I say this to kids, they're like, ma'am, are you like, are you an Oma? Which is like a uh, German for grandma. And I'm like, no, I'm not a grandma. <laughs> I'm just a generation that didn't have phones. I mean, our first phone was a Nokia. And I think that was when I was 14. It was quite late. And so I think what's amazing is how technology has really made the music world smaller and made us all connect better and play each other's music. And it's really, and the euphonium community also being such a progressive community in terms of finding other pe uh, people's music and stuff, you know, it's, it's developed. Uh, when I was at university, it was Harvard's, Chardas, it was that kind of standard ABRSM music. And if I look now how much music is available for the euphonium, I'm sort of almost like uh, intimidated because there's so much, but it's awesome. Like that's how music should be, I think. Well, I, I think, you know, being able to interview all these amazing composers like yourself is uh, we get to uh, dive into a person's personality, a composer's personality and their facet of how they approach music. And we'll get that, uh, we'll be able to uncover that in the other minuets uh, down the road uh other segments and um to be able to capture your 
your perspective, your intention, especially when we talk about African Sky uh, for the Leonard Falcone competition uh, and uh, other amazing works like the Silverbacked Fox, uh, possibly duet, you know, brass band, you know, just saying. Uh, um, but uh, taking these perspectives and uh, having like minded uh, performing artists perform these with the intended like like i like the framework that you had when you uh compose these and to hear it in someone else's perspective kind of like looking through that diamond right you you shift the diamond in each way you look at each yeah. different facet is a different way um and so uh wow yeah it's it's definitely the perspective and, and then you add the whole overlaying uh international aspect and your background from south africa and uh also teaching in germany um it, it's 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 very amazing mm -hmm. to get to be able to do this and uh in a way yes we we are the Omars and the Omas, uh, Opas, uh, of, well, of, it. <laughs> uh, right? Uh, it's coming back it's slowly, but yeah. surely. Um, and so, um, I, I think, you know, as someone in this, in this new world, uh, as far as a parent or, uh, a younger euphonium artist or a musician or anyone who's, diving into the history of Andrea Hobson, per se. Uh, you know, somewhere down the future, you know, someone's going to be researching, hey, what are all the Falcone competition uh, uh, pieces? And, you know, th there's a whole, like, segment. So if you're writing a doctoral thesis or, or a master's thesis or wanting to do a recital on women composers or uh, works that were only... Uh, were premiered or used at like a competition like <laughs> the African Sky, um, they're going to be referencing these interviews uh, yeah. and fair these enough. minuets. So yeah. fair enough, right? Perspective. Um, yeah. <laughs> and it, it's a real joy to be able to do this in, in real time instead of, you know, the dialogue <laughs> for sure, um, <laughs> the AOL. Uh, and or even putting these on cassette tape or <laughs> do you remember cassette tape well I, I mean I run to the radio to illegally record the top 40 you know with your cassette tape i remember I, that that was quite a big teenage uh, thing right put uh one one uh one um one uh jukebox or against uh, another one and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah the other I remember being so excited when we got the, the cassette tape at the front, you know, with the radio on the side. Yeah. I was like, yes, okay, I just have to press one button now. I mean, yeah, okay, no, I am feeling a little bit like a grandma now. Okay. But, so but then like again, this. you know, we, we, we look back on our histories and, you know, it, when the euphonium started, uh, I, being able to talk to Marina Bozzelli in Italy and, and being good friends with Dr. Henry Howie and the inception of uh, the euphonium, as uh, originally called Phil Cornobasso, uh, is really, uh, I'm watching the transcriptions uh, go over uh, all this. It's really fascinating. So the Phil Cornobasso, uh, the beginning of euphonium uh, to where we are now, I think the, uh, uh, Adolphus, the one that invented the euphonium, same inventor as the saxophone um would i i don't it would be like a da vinci i and i've said that a few times it's like to be able to uh envision such an amazing instrument and to have the skill of the performer back then uh to where it is now and being able to perhaps uh bird's eye view of seeing the opportunities of what we have today back then it's just yeah. mind-blowing even 20 years ago uh yeah. it, it's really special uh going back into your uh 
conservatory and your your first years in euphonium scales how did scales work was it just learn f and then g and then a and then b like you were saying with Semper Fidelis and such like that? Yeah, so, so we, we, we follow the, um, uh, the ABRSM, the Associated Board of Royal Schools of Music program in South Africa. I don't know how well known that is in the States. Um, yeah, so it's the English system. And so the first year we use the Silver Bidet series, and that would be your first year of studies. And then after that, you would graduate into your euphonium grade one exam. And so with that syllabus, there's a, pres a prescribed amount of scales that you need to learn in the year. There's also, I mean, ABRSM has already read about this. You can also buy a series, you know, like a book series of the scales, there's pieces, and each grade then develops certain aspects, you know, so that grade one is very simple, four, four times signature, three, four times signature, two, four times signature, grade two, you're now dealing with six eights and, so we kind of did that. And um, so in for a fuller child uh, kind of perspective, um, we started kind of early on, early on with long notes and flexibility. That was then additional material and scales was then part of the sort of prescribed syllabus that we had to learn. And we learned X amount every year and then just added on. And I did that with piano as well. So that was our system. And I think it's three pieces, two accompanied, two one unaccompanied like study uh x amount of scales oral for uh, oral training and then you'd have somebody play and you'd have to sing back and clap back and all that kind of stuff and then as part of that we were also required to do music theory because when you got to if you got as far as wanting to do the grade six abrsm exam you had to have grade five music theory so it's all part of the abrsm structure and that's kind of what we did and then in addition to that the band syllabus the band uh program as well huh i wonder if we could develop something like that uh, to be like kind of like a progression within these what we're doing here uh, for Farm for Dreams and uh, specifically for Euphoniums is uh, kind of help the uh, beginner artist, uh, beginner Euphonium artist uh, progress in that learning have in those goals, right? Yeah. Um, I think that would be beneficial because here in the United States, um, a lot of, I, I mean, I see a, a, a quite significant amount is the scales, the oral training is, and I want to dive into that oral training specifically. Did you learn solfege or a numeric no. notation or? No, no, nothing like that. We just, um, so, I mean, it's the, it's the typical sort of, uh, you know, well, we did um, 1B, 2B, you know, sort of your your inversions and all that kind of stuff, but we, it was combined with the music theory syllabus. So you, you use the same kind of language, but nothing like Solfege, um, which is unfortunate because I think Solfege is quite, Solfege is quite interesting. This, we've got a, two Spanish guys in our program here in Germany and they they sing Solfege and it's amazing to hear the story. And they start going and it's it's fascinating. Like, um, so it's kind of a pity, but no, we didn't, we didn't do anything like that. Um, the oral training, it has tests. So you need to sing to develop, you know, oral awareness uh, for pitch. You clap for rhythmical stuff. And then you need to answer like general questions. Um, so they'll play a piece of music to you and ask you things like, where's the forte passage? Where's the piano passage? Was there a crescendo? Was there a decrescendo? It's, it's quite fascinating. And it's interesting that you say that because in Germany, they also don't have that. So if you play trumpet, there's this amazing book here called the Trompetenfuchs. So like the trumpet fox. It's really great for beginners and it goes to like three different series. I haven't found similar for um, like baritone, tenor, horn, euphonium or tuba even. So tuba, there's like a really, it's a great book, but it's very child, not friendly, just from, from font and everything. Um, and so the trumpets have a great system, but the euphonium stones. And so I've actually relied very heavily on my ABRs in background in terms of developing the knowledge. So I do very similar required scales. I've added to that based on the brass band program that we have here, you know, so made it a little bit more brass bandy. Um, but yeah, I still follow that because I think it's a very sort of wholesome and full um, encompassing way of looking at music education. You know? So would you, so uh, as an educator and teacher and conductor and all, you know, your background, would you implement solfege or musical notation, like a numerical notation, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, stuff like I, that? I would, personally, I prefer solfege. I think solfege is, is great. And I would I would really like to see more do re mi. 
done. I think we go from 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 oral awareness. It's great understanding what we're singing is super. Well, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so, with articulation, um, you know, you mentioned a specific march, the Semper Fidelis, uh, and the articulation. You played that your your very first year. Yeah. Out of my head, and I'm not. So, I'm probably not very, very well, but it was like a goal, you know, to play. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's that's really uh, in, uh, uh, <laughs> advanced for a, a, a beginning. Uh, well, I, I guess it wasn't really a beginning band of sorts. It was you were added into the community. Oh yeah, I was the beginner. The band was really good. <laughs> so, <laughs> I guess, as I mentioned, it was myself, and I think in total five other girls. And uh, so the band could play it very well. We were the ones that just had to kind of, you know, just try a, a, a try our best, really. But then I just thought that was super cool. The ba ba da ba ba da boom, bum ba ba da ba ba da boom, and the and Nick, who was the Ukrainian player, he just he played like a pro, and he was just an amateur, like he was an amateur musician, but super good. And um, I wanted to play like him, and he played it so well. And so yeah, as I said, like I don't I don't even think I was actually reading it. I just did the fingerings, like going up, you know, and learned the rhythm. Yeah. So That's again. Cool. Probably not well, but it was something, it was like a way to learn and become better. So you, you mentioned, uh, so that dynamic uh, really works well with language learning and the inclusion uh, element uh, for, you know, those that are parents and uh, beginner euphonium artists, musicians, uh, is being uh, in a larger atmosphere of more professional performers than yourself and learning from and being mentored by other older section mates uh, is really important. I think, uh, you know, with language I and mean, music is a language. So uh, it, it just naturally makes sense. Um, wow, that's really cool. Uh, when you're Going back to when you, maybe the childhood age, when did you first like realize that you wanted to do this as a job, as a career? Only in high school. So, um, yeah, when I was in school, I mean, I didn't, I didn't enjoy my high school period particularly well for various reasons. I'm, I'm, my parents are very pro. I wouldn't say being outspoken, but definitely speaking your mind. And yeah, as I mentioned, I was at an all girls school. Um, you know, maybe it's not bad, it's maybe a bad advertising for my old school, but they kind of want, they, they made you wives. Like you were going to be the, the wives of the boys school. <laughs> and like my parents, even though, you know, at the time, because they've also grown, they were quite, because my, as I said, my dad's a minister and they were quite conservative as Christians. We were never told that we couldn't do something on the base of gender, for example. Um, and as children, we were all treated the same in that way. And so when I got to a school, which basically was telling me I couldn't do this because I was a girl, I was a little bit like, what now? And I also, my mom is super confident. I mean, my dad's also confident. My mom would then be considered, I guess, a little bit louder. She's very vocal. I was kind of trained the same way. So I often got into a lot of trouble at high school because I was just like, this is wrong and this is not okay and da, 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 and they didn't like that. So the music department became like a solace for me. So like, you know, you see those memes about the music department where people feel safe. That was that was absolutely 100% my case at, at high school. Um, and we did, I was then again in the wind band. Um, the wind band program was a little bit more stricter as we got higher. So you couldn't, in. we did standards, so standard six, standard seven, standard eight until standard 10. Uh, it's now great. And in standard six, you weren't allowed to be in the senior wind band. Um, but then what happened was is that there were no euphonium players uh, left. So I got to audition and I was granted the allowance to play under the, under the, the thing that under the premises that I would practice. So if I didn't practice, I would then be axed again by the end of like, I think, a three month probation. So that was kind of an incentive to practice. Um, and then we went to Cape Town, which is like one of the big cities in South Africa, and we did a wind band. It does, none of this exists anymore, unfortunately, but there was a huge, the WASB 
foundation was still in South Africa and there was a huge wind band competition and we played this really avant-garde wind at the time avant-garde piece called crystals I can't even remember the composer anymore but the saxophones got to play a wine yeah. glass it was so cool and um I just okay. loved the vibe oh you know okay so I was this is like going back into history and I just loved the vibe and yeah I was super interested so then I got in touch with the university and they were like, yeah, yeah, come along. Let's see what you can do. And I got to be involved in, in the university brass ensemble. Again, all of this, like, sort of as a trainee position kind of thing. Because I was very young. You were still in high school, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was, like, 14, 15. And um, then there was, like, this moment. I was walking down the street. It was 8 o'clock at night. The horn ensemble always practiced from 7 to 8. And then brass band, the brass ensemble started at 8. And there was this, I just remembered very distinctly, there was this beautiful street lamp. This lovely smell of the ocean and Humperdinck's horn octet evening prayer coming out the window. And I was like, this is what I want to do. Like, I want to be a musician. I hadn't really thought much about it up until that point as to whether I wanted to be a euphonium player or how all that kind of worked, but I wanted to be a musician. And when that did you was like. tell your parents? Oh, kind of early on. <laughs> yeah, pretty early, pretty early on. Yeah. Have, yeah. have you recollected with them this exact moment of the street lamp and the ocean and no 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 and I mean this is when like recollections may vary because in your questionnaire you sort of ask like how are your parents uh -huh. you know, being supportive so this is definitely recollections may vary situation my, like my parents are now like yeah we were always very supportive but I don't quite remember it that way they had a lot of anxiety of um me becoming a professional musician in South Africa with the landscape at the time because this is the issue all of these things that I'm mentioning even the scholarship that I had that doesn't exist in South Africa anymore because of the economic economy and how everything kind of went so they had a lot of anxiety um, and this is when my profit university was very helpful because I think my mom phoned him and said you know what is my daughter going to do because I got the scholarship and you could only have the scholarship if you studied music in school um, and I actually went to the university that I was at because I was going to then do journalism and music. That was my original idea. And then my professor was like, well, you know, and I'm a musician. How can you say this? And he then kind of told my mom that there were options. You know, you don't, it's not just performing, you know, and as, as I've mentioned, like he was very pro teaching and being, if you're going to be a musician, you have to know how to teach, you know, because that is sort of for him something that every musician has to do. So he then kind of, calm the calm the waters my extended family all thought i was um out of my mind um but they've since then kind of relaxed a little bit and uh, how at when okay so uh a lot of our audience may not be privy to the details of um your professor's uh uh teaching element and we covered that in the transcripts uh beforehand uh, so welcome to uh, dive into those um, as well. But when did your uh, <laughs> grandfather stop calling euphonium the foghorn? Never. He called it. He, so, but, but all my grandparents died quite early when I, when I was in high school. Um, but never. He, he called it the foghorn until like, yeah. Until the very last the minute. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean... Uh, I think, I mean, it was also my grandfather was, a, both my grandfathers in very different ways were very witty people, very witty men. And um, this particular grandfather was very, very, very cheeky. It's my mum's dad. And so for him, it was just like a thing now. Even if I played the, there was one piece that he really enjoyed was the sonata in F minor. I think that was like a grade five level. He loved it. But then it was also just, it's very pretty for a foghorn, you know, that <laughs> So unfortunately, it was just, it was the foghorn. That was, you know, that was just how it was. So what was your mom's favorite piece that you've played? Gosh, I don't, oh, no, no, no. So that is not, not in high school. I mean, I can't say for when, in, when, for when I was in high school, but I wrote a piece for my brother. My brother plays guitar and we wrote a piece for my father's 60th birthday and she really liked that ballad. So not when I was at school, it was much, much later. I can't say what she thought was a favorite piece then but now her favorite piece is dad's ballad which is something i wrote for my dad's 60th birthday that's really awesome and that's going to be really great uh content for the doctoral thesis that's that may be eventually written right um yeah. <laughs> that's really cool um yeah so oh that's fascinating from foghorns to uptown girl uh <laughs> that's really that's really really awesome um 
I wanted to, but I think this is a really great uh, stopping uh, point for this minuet, this chapter of life. Perhaps, I mean, there may be other questions that pop back into this minuet and cover uh, some background. Uh, I'm really curious on the ABRS structure and how that all works out and uh, perhaps uh, uh, evolving this further to where uh, the content uh, in programs like that can be developed to where we can uh, provide that program to anyone who is watching these uh, resources and getting all the uh, amazing content. Um, yeah. Just really taking that, the beginner euphonium artist to that next level even further. I mean, they, with all these resources, just really phenomenal. Um, I, and maybe, uh, I, and I put in my notes here, uh, I, I'm curious why you would uh, consider journalism uh, so we'll catch that uh, that up uh, in, in the next few minuets. I am assuming uh, that's really, and, and then uh, I, I think we uh, covered it in the transcripts. But I'm wondering if there are any photo recollections, like actual photos, of you with the ponytail in the euphonium. I have to ask my dad. I mean. Maybe. I mean, they've got so many photos of us when we were children, so I'd have to ask my dad. That would be a really awesome uh, highlight and blog post uh, for for our audience to uh, to get to share that uh, history um, and uh, probably a good photo for the doctoral thesis or master's thesis. Well, I mean, I kind of look the same. I haven't really. I mean, you can definitely see it's me. I still have the same face. I've just gotten older. <laughs> I've got some more wrinkles now. <laughs> Oh, you know what? Uh, we didn't cover in this video is, you know, your uh, your background, your your first euphonium that Jupiter. I think we we covered yeah. in the transcripts, uh, yeah. and that's when uh, the foghorn came out. I think uh, yeah. during that talk. But uh, uh, can you let everybody know what your first euphonium was? I won't be able to remember the model because oh, it was a fine. really old, old, old Jupiter euphonium. It was in a super ugly brown case. It was gigantic. It, it was basically it was very square, so obviously it protected the instrument very, very well. But it was an it was an enormous instrument, and I haven't really grown. I'm like one point five six, and I think I've always been very small, and in terms of stature. So the instrument was my size, and it was a really old, very heavy Jupiter euphonium. Well, it can definitely like a paperweight now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, yeah. Or, or perhaps uh, for those that uh, haven't read the transcripts uh, and your journeys with uh, your re most recent journeys and having Nova at home with the uh, paper ca catastrophe. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I can't wait to see uh, how uh, how life progresses and especially the life of the the this series of minuets with andrea hobson uh with uh with your whole journey and and the opportunities that this is going to provide the impact that um, someone will be seeing or or uh, hearing for the first time um i would love to we would love to know what you thought of this uh this particular minuet and if you would like a comment and a subscribe and just to follow this further down uh down and uh get a full encompassing view of this amazing andrea hobson composer artist um and just phenomenal uh musician as everyone that's been on the summit um uh, just thank you so much for joining us for this little snippet of uh, this amazing beginning. Oh, cool. yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you all for joining us uh, this time uh, on this po uh, broadcast uh, on any media. Uh, I'm still learning my words on all this. Um, thank you all so much for stopping by and can't wait to see you next time. Remember, serve well, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.